The Pokemon series is one that, if you've been following my other channel, I've obviously been playing for a while and still love to return to whenever I feel like I just want to play something fun without too much of a challenge, if there's one at all depending on the game. Recently, within the last four years, another series has taken over that mantle, not only due to the last few entries in the Pokemon series being extremely disappointing for me, with a few exceptions, but this other series has done a lot of things that not only have I wanted to see from a Pokemon game since the release of X and Y, as anyone with an earshot of me should know, through the process of playing its numerous sequels, I have quickly learned that the Persona games as of right now have easily taken over my spot of favorite RPG series. The issues I have right now came in when I began playing the game for today, Pokemon Legends Arceus, and realized just how much the two games had in common. From one of the best mechanics the series has added, the way the battles work, all the way to its story, this game, regardless of these issues, not only takes the spot as my favorite Pokemon game, but it also proves a point that I tried to make not too long ago perfectly. That point being, a game can take inspiration for the way it does things, while not feeling like the player is getting ripped off or is playing a completely different game. Even though that kinda goes against the point that I'm trying to make, but uh, we're just gonna move on anyway I guess. What I mean by this if you're not aware is, 7 months ago I made a video criticizing how Sonic Frontiers stole a lot of ideas from Breath of the Wild, pretty shamelessly at that. The overall tone shift of the game, the Titans being reskinned, Divine Beast, Stagman being stuck between dimensions for like 80-90% to 90 of the game just like Zelda, Blood Moons are just there for some reason, and lastly the Coco are yet again just reskinned Koroks. To be fair, in the grand scheme, it isn't very much to work off of, because the rest of the game is pretty original, I guess. But when you actually pick up the game and realize you're just exploring a great value version of Hyrule with Sonic instead of Link, and are playing through a very similar, almost carbon copy of Breath of the Wild's story, it's kind of hard to keep a straight face at the idea that you paid $60 for and played Breath of the Wild Furry Edition. Don't get me wrong, as I've already pointed out, PLA has its own issues with stealing ideas, but in this case I give it a bit more of a pass. I know it's kinda weird cause you think I'd be a bit more cynical towards Game Freak stealing ideas from my favorite series at the moment, but you wanna know why? It's because they hit it a bit better than Frontiers did. I know that's kinda f***, but let me explain what I mean. When I played Frontiers for the first time, I was pretty blind to the idea that they were just straight up copying ideas from Breath of the Wild and adding them to that game. This was due to me not having played Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom at the time. Flash forward almost a year and I have finally played the game everyone compared this one to, and I'm floored by how blatantly they just yoinked all this stuff from Breath of the Wild. On the other hand we have PLA, which now in hindsight I obviously see all the stuff that was yoinked from Persona 5. With that being said, you should be seeing the main new mechanic of PLA, that being the backstrike as I'm showing it on the screen right now hopefully. This is very helpful because if you pull it off, not only does it daze the Pokemon for up to 2 turns, but you also automatically outspeed, regardless of your Pokemon's speed stat. Trust me, this will be important later. Now that you've seen the clip, let's move on to this clip I got while playing Persona 5 Royal. Alright, hey guys, so um, obviously I'm doing a Pokemon Legends Arceus review right now, but um, I just wanted to show you guys, because I have no idea what I'm putting in the script right now, but um, I just wanted to show you guys what it, the difference is between backstriking in Pokemon Legends Arceus and doing an ambush in Persona 5. Uh, basically, there is no f***ing difference, it's the same goddamn thing. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there you go, that's uh, all you need to know, it's, it's literally the same thing. As you saw, the backstrike, which I honestly praised in my first playthrough of this game, is actually just a ripped ambush mechanic. The way it works, from landing it causing the wild mon to become stunned, to missing it on an agromon doing the complete opposite, on top of everything else having the rest of the battle being speed based, it's undeniably the same mechanic. The reason I'm so hellbent on pointing this out is because unlike what happened with Breath of the Wild and Frontiers, with this game it took me 5 playthroughs to realize this was an issue. It could absolutely just be me being stupid and not paying attention, but the fact that I didn't really notice it on the first 4 times, especially since I had already played Persona 4 on my first playthrough, whereas I noticed stuff like Frontiers version of a Blood Moon instantly says a lot. 
This is not the only change to the battle mechanics I noticed the more I played, however the other thing which one of my friends pointed out is that the battle system instead of being turn based, this time purely being determined by speed, yet again is taken from Persona 5. In that game you have a team of 4 in each fight and each of those members has a speed stat that unless you actually pay attention like I started to on this playthrough, you would never notice that's how the battles worked. Because until it was pointed out to me recently, I always just assumed the order was randomized each fight. Clearly, that was wrong. Finally, the reason I don't really consider PLA to be a Pokemon game is obviously because it's not. Everything that makes a Pokemon game a Pokemon game, outside of there obviously being Pokemon in it, doesn't really exist in PLA. There's no multiplayer until you count trading, you can't fish, there's no set path, you can just kind of do whatever you want. This kind of falls under the umbrella of the last issue, but you can get a level 60 plus Alpha Blissey before battling the first noble Pokemon. And lastly, the thing everybody hated from Alola, there are no gyms and very limited battles. I really don't want to say it because I know it's going to piss off someone, but the only reason I enjoy this game and it's my favorite Pokemon game, hell it's even the reason I think it's a lot of people's favorite Pokemon game, is for the exact reason I already stated. This isn't a Pokemon game. It's a Persona game with Pokemon in it. And by that I mean, it's just a JRPG with Pokemon in it. The funny part is I feel like I'm not the only one who feels this way and we haven't even started talking about the story which is my most important part in this argument. With that being said, let's get into the story. The story of PLA is easily where it shines, which is saying a lot because the catching mechanics are easily the best the series has added. Once again, it feels like Game Freak used Persona 5 as a base for the game's story, which feels like a pretty weird choice when you consider that the first two villains of the game are a teacher who physically abuses his volleyball team, views them as slaves and forces one of your teammates into having relations with them, while the next one is a fraudulent artist who watches a woman die of a seizure so he could steal her painting, then grooms her 3 year old son and uses him for slave labor for 13 years. Don't get me wrong, I love Persona 5's story, that's why I like that game as much as I do, and I love PLA's story, but when I realized toward the end of the game specifically what was actually happening in the story, it's kind of hard to not make the connections of where the inspiration for PLA's story came from, pretty obviously. Now that we laid out everything, let's actually get into the story. The story of PLA begins honestly very similarly to a mystery dungeon game and a Poké Park game. You begin by selecting your character, you're pulled into a time rift, you're contacted by Arceus who transforms your phone, and you wake up on a beach to the sight of the three starters who are being chased by the professor of the game named Laviton. This catching tutorial and the trial following it present us with more information than you'd expect. That being, people fear Pokemon so much that catching 3 of them is just as impressive as 34 other kids fighting literal gods. The other thing this proves is that Pokemon endangerment is real. The starters aren't Turtwig, Chinchar, and Piplup. In fact, they're actually fairly easy to find throughout the game which makes perfect sense cause it's Sinnoh. The only problem is, in Diamond, Pearl, Platinum, Brilliant Diamond, and Shining Pearl, you can only get one of the 3 due to them being gift starter Pokemon. But this game proves they weren't always rare, they literally come from this region, so how were there only one of each of them within the whole region if they weren't actively being hunted? Especially when all three of their evolutions, middle and final, can be found in the wild as well. Getting back to the actual story, this is also where we learn of a couple other important figures. One of them is named Benny, who we'll get to later. But for now, he's the guy that runs the village restaurant called The Sunflower and is a bit more apprehensive to the idea of letting an outsider, us, into the village. On the other hand, we have Silene, the captain of the Galaxy Team Survey Corps, and Resident Tardis, who is actually really nice and protective over us behind closed doors. She pretends to only care about your progress and what you can do for the team, but later when you're actually in trouble and need help, she's the only one to stick a leg out for you, defy orders, and truly do what she thinks is right. Lastly, we have Ray, Rai, I don't really know how to say their name, and Akari, depending on which gender you choose for your character. In this case being Rai for me, cause I chose the female character. As they have basically since the release of Black and White, the rival in this game isn't really a rival, they're more of a friend who looks up to you cause you're a strong trainer. 
In this case, they're kind of an Ash stand-in, but not really at the same time. They have a Pikachu who hates being stuck in its Pokeball, but Rai forces it in regardless. Instead of it being a friendly partner to whichever rival you get, it acts kind of more like how Ashes did in the first episode of the anime. It doesn't really want to battle, to the point that as far as I remember, Rai says something about it shocking him pretty often. And it just generally has an attitude toward its trainer. It's definitely not the same as Ash's, but it's very close. Whereas Rai is the complete opposite of Ash. He doesn't really understand how people enjoy battling. He's actually terrified of Pokemon in general and only begins to take a real interest in his work with the Galaxy team once we show up. I actually started to somewhat take an interest in Rai because unlike the characters it feels like he somewhat was based on, being Hao and Hop, he feels like he has a legitimate reason for why he's not a very competent battler other than just not being that guy like the other two. He's battling to understand the appeal of and improve from it, not because it's just something everybody does or because it's something he enjoys doing. You slowly see his progression and honestly he turns out to be a decent trainer by the end. I'm really trying to avoid saying battler because that's stretching it quite a bit. The next thing I wanted to mention quickly is the fact that I was actually kind of impressed by this tree. Don't get me wrong, I know how stupid that sounds, but let me explain. If you're like me and for some reason are playing this game again, you can actually throw your Pokemon at and knock the berries out of this tree before you receive a tutorial from Rai. What I didn't expect, due to it obviously being a scripted scene, is the berries actually disappear from the tree, even in the cutscene. Again, don't get me wrong, but my Game Freak gives a shit meter has been drained for a couple years at this point, so any little details like this shock the hell out of me in a Pokemon game. Um, we don't talk about him. Or those. Finally, after going through the rest of the tutorial, we return to the village, receive our new team uniform, and are forced to introduce ourselves to, and tackle, one of Rowan's ancestors named Komodo, the commander of our team and head of the village. Finally, Rai teaches us the crafting mechanic and we get easily the most important tool in the game, the Pokedex. I love that this game didn't try using your phone or something as the Pokedex and actually took the opportunity to make it a book instead. Other than someone like Oak talking about it or Blue in the Let's Go games, this is the first time we've seen what an old Pokedex would look like, which is really cool. Finally, we learn how to dodge roll, receive the portable crafting kit, and learn how to increase our star rank within the Galaxy team. The next day we start by battling Rai and his Pikachu along with being introduced to Zizu. I have no idea how to say that name, I'm just going to tape it out on the screen, you can work with that how you want. Who explains what agile and strong style moves are and what they do. Which honestly is way more helpful than I thought it would be. Especially seeing as I didn't really understand how they worked before having it laid out for me. Next Volos shows us how to do a backstrike, which if you saw the short, honestly you probably didn't. You know I have my own problems with that mechanic. We're also introduced to Mai, our first interaction with a clan member in the game. I have no idea what the fuck this was. And finally, we're introduced to our first story-based alpha Pokemon in the form of a Krikatoon battle. After waking up the following day, we're introduced to Irida and Adamin, the Pearl and Diamond clan leaders, who are currently arguing outside the Galaxy team building about their religious beliefs. As you'd expect, the Pearl Clan follows Palkia while the Diamond Clan follows Dioda. The issue with their characters in my opinion is these arguments get kinda confusing if you're not really paying attention to the dialogue. This is because before we intervene and due to there being no documentation of Dialga or Palkia, neither side realizes they're talking about different Pokemon during these arguments. It doesn't help that they both refer to them as Almighty Sinnoh. I think the funniest part about them is they never go anywhere exactly for that reason. Kind of like how the one side mission is about showing the three people arguing about the different types of Burmy they want to see. Like, what was the point of this? I get that the point is their argument would never be solved till somebody proves someone wrong. It just feels weird to have such a pointless argument be most of the story's focus. On the other hand, after speaking with Komodo, as much as I feel like my point still stands, I find it really cool to think about the fact that our interruption happening the way it did completely stopped a war. No, I'm not kidding. To anyone who didn't pay attention to the story while playing this game, that's the whole point of us dealing with the noble Pokemon. You're not only trying to help the frenzy Pokemon, but your intervention is also the only means of stopping a war brewing between the two clans due to the Pokemon severely hurting members of all three parties. 
The reason we're tasked with dealing with the situation is because Cleavor is a noble belonging to the Pearl Clan, so they don't want to bring it down as it's said in the game, while the Diamond Clan cannot get involved either or that alone would restart the war that was currently resolved between them. The Galaxy team is the middleman that has to deal with their problems, and unfortunately we got roped into it. Since we covered all that, the last thing I wanted to talk about that I noticed, which is kinda cool, is that as we're leaving the room, Adamant hints towards him eventually asking us to help deal with Electrode if everything works out. I love when a game foreshadows like this, so to see it in a Pokemon game kinda blew me away, <laughs> as stupid as it sounds. I'll be honest, the next part is easily where the amount of battles half of the community bitched about for so long really starts to stand out. Cause like now that you beat Alpha Cricketoon, you can spawn at the camp close to the middle of the map. The problem is Cleavor is on the other side of the map. So unless you're crazy like me, or just smart cause you know early enough that you want to battle Arceus, the game just turns into a walking simulator and the worst part about it is this isn't the last time you have to do it. You have to walk all the way there, progress the story by talking to Cleavor's warden Leon, battle his Gumi, return back to the village, talk with Laventine about creating food balls to throw at Cleavor as a way to quell it, then do the same trek back to the arena to fight Cleavor because the fly point doesn't become available yet, while possibly seeing a reason to never touch grass again on the way. Personally, as I said, this wasn't a huge issue for me because I was attending to 100% the game, which didn't happen anyway yet, so f*** me I guess, but I absolutely see why somebody just trying to play the game <laughs> would get kind of annoyed playing through these sections, because oh boy, if you think this only happens once, you couldn't be more wrong. Ironically, after my short rant about their argument being stupid, Irida is the only reasonable one in this situation. She acknowledges that we're her only hope at this point to deal with Cleavor, but doesn't trust that we have the same intentions until we meet her in a battle. Winning allows us to challenge and quell Cleavor to the surprise of both Irida and Leon. Lastly, we return to the village, report to Komodo, and end the day by receiving a new request to collect spirits that have now been scattered around the six maps. We start the next day by getting introduced to a new character from the Diamond Clan named Irizu. I, again, have no idea if I pronounced that name right, but uh, we'll deal with it. Who came to the village to warn Komodo about a raging Ursa Luna in the second map called the Crimson Mirelands. Yet again, another Pokemon owned by the Pearl Clan. There is a problem with that, which we'll talk about soon. Following this, we battle with Rai, who afterward warns us about a new mechanic called space-time distortions. Or, oh, they didn't really think that one through, did they? Jokes aside, these were actually huge for me to get access to, because certain Pokemon can only be found this way, such as the Porygon line, Magnemite and Magneton, but not Magnezone for some reason, which is pretty weird when you think about it both Gen 4 fossil lines, and lastly, until the Daybreak update, this was also the only way to get extra starters outside of the gift mons. But now you can just get them in mass and mass outbreaks. Getting back to the story, we arrive in the Crimson Mirelands, where we speak with Laventon and Rai before darting to the Slaceon Ruins. We're introduced to another Pearl Clan member and our saloon as warden named Kalaba. She's instantly aware of our flute and who we are, but voices, or I guess types, her concerns towards how we handle the situation with Cleavor. She correlates our actions to us bullying the Pokemon into submitting to us, while also complaining about us using our Pokeballs to capture Pokemon. Lastly, she shoes us off after stating that she doesn't need help from us or the Diamond Clan. Before leaving, we're confronted by and battle with Volo, who tells us about the wall fragment that was stolen from the ruins, causing us to go searching for it. Luckily, we recover it pretty quickly after running into the Misfortune Sisters, a group made up of Galaxy Team, Diamond, and Pearl Clan members. The only thing that kind of pisses me off about them story-wise is that two of them are ancestors of the Gym Leader and an Elite Four member, but then one of them is just a Team Galactic Admin for some reason. I don't really get why they couldn't just pick another Gym Leader or something, like Gardenia was right there. Returning back to the ruins, we hand over the wall fragment to Kalaba, who begins to relent after rereading the passage, allowing us to battle our Saluna. After calming our Saluna down, Kalaba takes a look at it, realizes it wasn't frenzy like Cleavor was, and points out that there were remnants of some powder stuck to its fur, causing the questioning to fall onto Irizu due to her being the last person close to the Pokemon, on top of her being a Diamond Clan member. After returning to the village, we attend to report to Komodo about Ursaluna, 
But before we can say anything, Adamin begins telling us about how their own noble Pokemon Lilligan is currently frenzied and Urza knew about it but didn't say anything, letting the situation get worse. Lastly, she's nowhere to be found in the village. Yet again, before leaving the village, we're put in an awkward spot where, unless we're able to confirm that Urzu had nothing to do with their Saluna situation, war will instantly begin between the clans. Adamin doesn't really help with this because he automatically questions Kamado on which side he would support if the war were to break out, but he's also reasonable when he realizes the Galaxy team would have to stay neutral due to them being responsible for the end of the first war. Finally, we're able to share our information and Kamado tasks us with finding Erizu. Returning to the Crimson Mirelands, we search for Erizu and find her pretty easily. She sprained her ankle while running away from a Pokemon that was chasing her and couldn't get up. Kalaba finds us and apologizes for how she treated Erizu. But Erizu also explains that the reason her Saluna became enraged was due to getting too close to the Frenzy Lilligan, who used poison powder on it. Lastly, the reason she went to our village was to get help from her Saluna and learn how to craft. But after talking with Laventon, learned about our bonds we used on the cleaver and attempted to quell the Lilligan herself. Finally, Admin finds us and scolds Erizu for trying to do everything herself, regardless of him also understanding why she did it, and we're tasked with quelling Lilligan. Which we do and return to the village to report to Kamado. Similarly to how I felt about Rai, this is when I actually began to become interested in Kamado's character, because this guy goes through a whole Sam Raimi Robbie arc. What I mean by this is in Raimi Spider-Man 2, Robbie very much hints towards the idea that he's aware of Peter being Spider-Man, and Peter is aware that Robbie knows, but they never outright say it to anyone. Kamado goes through a similar arc, but the opposite way. From the scene on, he makes it extremely clear that he's glad to have us around because we're helping him out, but at the same time hints at the idea that he's extremely skeptical of our true intentions regardless of what we're doing. I love and hate this for this character because while I realize he kind of feels skeptical for no reason later in the game, it also feels like he's the only character to have a level head and realize that regardless of our actions and how we're helping the village, we could still be responsible for what happens later regardless of it being our intention or not. Just a quote so it doesn't feel like I'm pulling this out of my ass. He says, a stranger falls into our world from a rift in space-time. The frenzies are introduced by strange lightning, which likewise falls from the very same rift. But you have no connection to the lightning, isn't that right? That quote alone could be viewed as a question, but the line following it proves he doesn't completely trust us without investigating the rift, which comes into play later. Starting off the next day, Erzu becomes the new hairdresser of the village, and we go to Prelude Beach with Kamado so he can tell us about how the village started, along with helping to move some new settlers into the village. After being ordered to Kamado's office, we learn something kind of interesting compared to the way the rest of this game is set up. Being that our next task is to just do research within the Cobalt Coastlands. This is due to there being no knowledge or warning of noble Pokemon being there. The weird thing is Eird is here and I don't really know why. She's kind of just here, tells you about how their old noble was tragically taken away, and then Kamado tells us we're actually playing Luigi's Mansion 4 because they've been receiving reports of people getting attacked by ghosts on Fire Spit Island. I swear there's actually a point to the story wise and it makes perfect sense when it's laid out in front of you, but I was really confused by the scene too at first. After finally arriving in the Cobalt Coastlands, we are introduced to another member of the Pearl Clan named Paulina, and Warden of the future Noble Arcanine. Other members of the Pearl Clan view her as a terrible Warden due to her not pressuring Growlithe to evolve and become the new Noble. But when you understand that she doesn't pressure it because its parent just died, her response becomes pretty reasonable. Lastly, she tells us to find Iskan of the Diamond Clan, so he can help us get a new ride Pokemon called Basculegion or ending the conversation by stating that she believes regardless of the currently uneasy peace between the clans, the lightning and time rift are due to Almighty Sinnoh's anger towards the Diamond Clan's worship towards a false image of it. On our way to talk with this can we run into Volo, who frankly seems to know a little too much about these plates and the Pokemon who have them, but we'll get back to that later. For now we talk with this can who asks us to catch a dust clops so it can light the fire we'll use to cook the food that we need to make bait for our basculation. In the process of it becoming our new ride Pokemon, not only do we learn that Iskan and Paulina are playing Romeo and Juliet, 
but also the Misfortune Sisters appear and capture Pollyanna's Growlithe, who they then take to Fire Spit Island in an attempt to make it evolve. As stupid and honestly kind of pointless as the scene is, it shows an important detail that doesn't really come back up unless you think about it from what I remember. You see this girl charm? You see her Gengar behind the Growlithe? You see this dialogue talking about how people on Fire Spit Island were getting attacked by shadows? I really hope I don't have to explain where I'm going with this because it feels kind of obvious and we're now moving on to Fire Spit Island. Which actually has a couple things to talk about regardless of how simple it probably seems. Similarly to the tree thing I talked about back on the first map, the first thing you see when you get to the island are three boats. This detail wasn't really needed, but I really appreciate it and think it's cool that they took the time to put them there. Second is how when Paulina and Niskan show up, they talk about how the Growlithe swam to the island. I kinda like it for the story to show that the Pokemon care about each other and everything, but how the fuck did he do that? Brother, you're a fire rock type. You die to rain. Now that I think about it, how the hell did the Noble go swimming for the little Growlithe? Screw that, how the hell is this kid still alive? No effect this arc, the more I think about it, this one just sucks regardless of the cool stuff it does. Jokes aside, this one is actually really cool. We get to see Growlithe evolve, then become a noble. Also, we learn that Paulina doesn't like Yurida, which to me makes perfect sense because I don't really like her either. Finally, after arriving back in the village, we report to Kamado, who's still being passive-aggressive, and we end the day. Today starts with honestly the weirdest interaction of the game, being our kinda introduction to the Pearl Clan member Ingo. The reason this guy is so weird is because he has a case of shadowitis. What I mean by this is he's the same guy from the Gen 5 games, except he lost all of his Pokemon and doesn't remember anything before arriving at Isui, the same way we did. I love this from the perspective of a Pokemon fan who can recognize the character, where he's from and what he does, but it also gives me FNAF PTSD, because my first thought when I saw him was, how the fuck are you here and are you the same guy? Which I feel like are pretty fair questions. Next, Commando tasks us with challenging the Noble Electrode in the Cornet Highlands. But before we leave, we're introduced to this egotistical dick, Melly, and we're forced to battle Adamant as a way of proving ourselves to him. Lastly, we find Ingo and head out. After arriving in the Highlands, we meet up with Ingo again and learn that he's the warden of a new Pokemon called Sneasler. We trek through the mountain, but learn even more why Melly's a dick through him removing the torches that were used to not only light up the cave, but stop Pokemon from attacking us as well. After escaping from the cave, we learn a little bit more about Ingo. Including that he does remember how his brother Emin and partner Pokemon Chandelure existed, he just doesn't have a clear picture on who either of them were. We are then forced into a battle with him which allows us to gain access to Sneasler. After climbing up the mountain, we confront Melly about taking the torches down, battle him so that he'll let us battle Electrode, and lastly, regardless of him not wanting to along with Adamin getting involved, he lets us quell Electrode. After the battle, Lingo talks with Melly and Adamant about how he remembers what it was like in his time, which we're able to confirm. We report to Kamado and end the day. The next day is where my point of comparing the story to Persona 5 begins to take form slightly. Which is because similarly to that game, this one made your confrontation with the last noble Pokemon a bit more controversial. Avalug is the last noble, which we must deal with in a new area called the Alabaster Icelands. But the issue comes in when we're informed that it hasn't done anything yet. It hasn't hurt anyone or destroyed anything, so its warden is understandably a little bit upset that we want to disturb the Pokemon, regardless of there being no proof that it did anything wrong. Persona does this arc except in that game it's much more focused on to the point that it actually results in a civil war between the team. This isn't the only story Beta shares with PLA, it's just the first one. Honestly, it's also the easier one to explain. So let's just move on. We actually talk about this with Ryan Laventon before leaving for the Icelands. And Laventon kind of impressed me because he agreed that it doesn't really make sense for us to intervene with a noble who hasn't done anything wrong, regardless of them being frenzied or not. Obviously things change, but it's a valid criticism that I wasn't expecting this game to go out of its way to tackle. Once we get to the Icelands, Adamant finally makes the clarification I was waiting for because was it obvious? But we're introduced to two new characters being Garrick, Avalug's Warden, and Sabi, Braviary's Warden. Garrick is the one I already talked about who's kinda pissed we want to disturb Avalug, which again is understandable, while Sabi is just kinda weird I guess. 
You chase her around for a bit all the way to the top of Snow Point Temple. After beating Braviary, we get the ability to glide. With it, we can now collect the Eternal Ice and use it as bait while quelling Avalug. Oddly enough, again on the way to Avalug, we run into Volo, who's delivering something to Garrick. But we quickly quell Avalug, and the last thing we learn before returning to the village is that the praise I gave to Garrick's character was misplaced because it has nothing to do with our morals. He just thought us intervening would screw with his clan's religious views. Ending the day, we report to Commodo, who isn't exactly thrilled that we didn't learn anything new, but at the same time is happy with our work. There's one more thing that I actually forgot about until I replayed this part, but I'll let it go for now because it'll be more important in a minute. Today is the day where stuff gets a little more crazy. The RGB split effect that happens in OG Gen 4 is now covering the sky just like it did in those games, but the real problem comes in when we go talk with Commodo and the others. He begins to accuse us of being responsible for the changes happening. He points out that the first lightning strike that hit Cleavor happened on the night we showed up. He also says that it's only natural to think they're connected, which to be fair he's right about. But he also states exactly what I was thinking on my first playthrough, being that we could have caused the frenzies just to quell them to gain the trust of the village. That's obviously not what happened, but the line of thought makes sense, kind of. This is exactly what I didn't bring up a minute ago. Leventon points out that if the rift were to close, we can't go home. And him saying it made me realize that could also be one of Commodore's concerns, he just never says it. Being that we're taking advantage of the village in some way and we'll just leave when we get what we want. Again, obviously that isn't what happens, but it makes sense to be a concern he may have. He also makes a very valid point, being that we have no proof of the claims we've been making since we fell out of the sky. Finally, we're kicked out of the galaxy team and the village until we can prove our innocence. Which to be fair is kind of extreme, but at the same time he did warn us he'd take these actions a little while ago. This is yet again where I must make my connections to how Persona 5 does the story. In that game, it also does a very similar arc to this one. You do everything exactly the same as always, to the point that it becomes natural. But then someone else behind the scenes interferes and you get framed for the death of a person you were meant to be changing. You were just starting to get people to believe in your group, to the point that they ask for you in an attempt to deal with their own problems. But the moment they caught wind of what you did, everyone's opinions of you changed, to the point that they act like they expected you to be terrible people from the very beginning. It doesn't help that you had an important public figure contradicting your every action, but after everything you pretty much rely on gods to help you fix your own issues or outright challenge them yourself while beating the public figure in the middle of it all. I know I took a pretty weird departure from the rest of the video, but the rest of the game is pretty standard Pokemon to tell you the truth. You capture the gods as I already mentioned, defeat the champion, in this case Volo being the stand-in. Otherwise it's just a lot more story that if you haven't played yourself I can't suggest trying yourself more. Volo is also easily the most fun battle in the series. The only other connections I was able to make is kind of like how in Persona 5 the confidant characters help you a lot more than you'd expect in the end and these connections are completely based on your actions. Similarly to how your actions help grow your connections with everyone who helps you get back into the village in PLA. Also this end section, I'm pretty sure unintentionally, also seemed to use Persona 5's theme of cognition being a huge driving factor on how you're viewed by society. Again, I don't think this was intentional, it just seems like a happy accident. The other thing is if you've played Persona 4, first the way fog works in the game as far as spawning mass and mass outbreaks also seems like a hint towards that game. Second, Volo feels like he was very much meant to be an Adachi like character but missed the mark a bit. Might be a huge reach for both, frankly it probably is, but I'm just putting it out there cause I don't know, just feels weird to me. With that being said, that's all I got for the story, so let's talk about the stuff I did between the story gameplay wise cause that'll probably take a bit on its own. The gameplay of PLA is an extremely weird thing for me to talk about, because while I enjoy all the new mechanics and some of the other things it brought back, but changed slightly, I don't think I'll be touching the game again for a while. 100%ing this game is honestly torture after a while. There are Pokemon like Bidoof, Starly, and Shinx who are perfectly fine, but then there are Pokemon like Garchomp who make you watch the same two moves 120-ish times because you also need to see it use strong and agile style moves. 
you haven't even touched on Pokemon like Pachirisu, who again aren't that bad, until you get to the task that makes you see it spawn from a tree 25 times, which probably doesn't sound bad at first, but after spending hours looking at every shaking tree across the same map, weighs on you after a while. That doesn't even count having to return to the village between each check, because that's the only way they respawn. Then there's easily the worst of them all being Magnemite, which you need to catch at least 10 of, and then battle another 15 to 20. Which again, doesn't sound that bad, till you realize it only spawns in space-time distortions. So you can only get up to 3 of them per map reset if you're lucky, and one spawns at all. That's because you can also get a Magneton or Magnezone in its spot. On top of all of that, a distortion spawning is also a roll, so that might not even spawn in the first place. Forcing yourself to do this is literal insanity, that's why I quit. Unfortunately, if you saw the discussion board posts, you'd know I spent a little too much time on this. But for a while, it was worth it. I got a couple shiny alpha Pokemon which are rare on their own, but then I also got easily my rarest shiny ever, being a shiny alpha tree combi. Other than the style moves being a bit scuffed, I think overall this game is relatively fun. Also, I can accept there being limited battles because it fits the story they wanted to tell. Otherwise, since there's going to probably be more of these games, the only thing I'd say is to change up the side quests. There's way too many of them, and most of them do nothing except for a couple. Like there's one where you battle Riley's ancestor, then there are the Path of Solitude quests. The stuff like that are cool, but then there's stuff like complete the deck century, or get me so many of these items, do the balloon race, do the archery challenge, etc. There are so many that just feel extremely pointless. The main thing otherwise that I got some good old nostalgia out of were the references to the ancestors, certain places on the map, and what they were called. Examples include Leventon originally being from the Galar region, Benny being revealed as Wally's ancestor along with him being a ninja, being a reference to Hoenn and Sinnoh being the only regions with ninja classes, along with it subtly explaining why they only appear in those regions. Garrick being Wolfric's ancestor, Irida being Maze, Komodo being Rowan's. Obviously, we already mentioned the Misfortune Sisters and Ingo. But then there's the idea that Adamant is the leader of the clan that worships the god of time, and we only meet someone related to him for the first time in Scarlet and Violet. On the other hand, we had the places examples. For them, include pretty obvious places like Jubilee Village is Jubilee City, Ramanas Island is Ramanas Park. Orboro Tunnel is Orbert Gate, Veilstone Cape is Veilstone City, Celestic Ruins references Celestic Town, the Pearl Settlement in Alabaster Iceland is Snow Point City, but then you have some that are a little less clear, like Prelude Beach being Cantilave City, the Flower Patch where you do the Shaman event becomes the Valley Windworks, the Scarlet Bog is the Great Marsh. Lastly, you have the extremely obvious ones, like the Cornet Highlands is Mount Cornet, you have Snow Point Temple, the Heartwood being Eternal Forest, and the Galaxy Team building changes a couple letters. I really enjoy this game, I just think outside the references and Pokemon being everywhere, it's not a Pokemon game, which is why I think a good amount of people didn't really like this one, because it's just generally an RPG with Pokemon in it. I think that's all I have to say about the game, so with that being said, if you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and make sure to turn on the bell. Just because I know somewhat soon I will be doing a video that I won't be sending out notifications for, but I will be posting a link to the community tab, so making sure you'll get those posts as well if you want to see that video will be important. Otherwise I should also have a link to my Discord server and Twitter, I never calling it X on ironically and you can't make me, there as well. With that, I'll see you guys in the next video.